uh, weekly colloquium. Uh, and I don't need to remind you that it is weekly, and you can find out about the uh, upcoming colloquia on the SETI Institute's website, SETI.org. I'll keep this, I, I was planning a two-hour intro, but I'll try and keep this brief because we want to hear what Carver has to say here. But let me point out to you that, of course, Mars is everyone's favorite inhabited planet, and there's a reason for that. You know, back about three or 400 years ago with the first telescopes being aimed at the sky instead of at the neighbors, if you had a telescope, as you would in those days, where the objective lens would fit in your pocket, it wasn't probably much bigger than that, think about it. The only planet you could look at that showed any interesting detail that could be on the surface of the planet was Mars, right? You look at Venus, and, you know, it's covered with clouds. It's as, as blank as, I don't know, a Hollywood bullet, right? You could look at Mars, Jupiter, but you're just looking at the weather when you see these stripes and so forth. But Mars, Mars showed some interesting details. So right away, Mars became everybody's choice for the planet which might ha uh, house some, for example, Martians. All right, well, if you walk down the corridors of the SETI Institute, you'll find that uh, you know, of the 80 researchers there, the majority, this is my informal poll, uh, actually study Mars. And that includes Adrian Brown, who, by the way, uh, is seldom at these colloquia, but arranges all of them. He's on the East Coast, and uh, he does a fantastic job at doing that. All right, so that, uh, that shows you the popularity of our little ruddy buddy even hundreds of years after the first uh, maps of Mars were made. Carver is going to talk to you about dry ice, CO2, frozen CO2. It sounds like something for the good humor man, covering the south polar cap, um, as much CO2 as is in the atmosphere of Mars. And so the big question is, how did that happen? Carver got his BA in astronomy from Northern Arizona University. That's Flagstaff, right? Yeah, it's, it's actually a pretty place. Uh, and is also the home of the Lowell Observatory, where Lowell 100 years ago was mapping the canals on Mars, giving them all nice Latin names in case the Martians hadn't bothered. He's now a grad student at UC Santa Cruz. And uh, I have to say that if you look up his research interests, he is truly a Renaissance man. He's interested in Pluto, exploring the Pluto-Charon system, Venus atmosphere chemistry, tidal dissipation on EO, lunar crater gravity, and Mars' south polar cap. All right, without further palaver from me, here's Carver Beerson. Thank you very much for that wonderful intro, and thank you guys for having me here today. Um, this is work that I've done with a large number of collaborators listed here and others. Uh, Zach Bain is a high school student who's helping me with some of the uh, kind of next steps for this research that I'll talk about at the end. Um, so let's dive in here. As Seth mentioned, there's been a lot of interest in Mars, South, or Mars polar caps for a long time. This is a map made in the early 1900s by Percival Lowell, mapping out all the canals on Mars which he thought that the Martian civilization was using to bring water from the polar caps to the warmer equatorial regions where they were living. And now that we have lovely spacecraft imagery of the planet, we don't see canals all over the surface, but we still see the polar caps. These polar caps change dramatically seasonally, like our polar caps are on the Earth. So that you can see this spanning essentially one Mars year going in the north, where we have lots of CO2 ice developing in the local winter and then sublimating away. But one thing that's important to understand about Mars polar caps versus the Earth is the way that they're interacting with the atmosphere. We can break up in terrestrial atmospheres into lots of ways, but one is to say that on planets like the Earth and Venus, the main components of our atmosphere here, nitrogen and oxygen, are much too warm to ever condense out onto the surface. But on Mars, carbon dioxide is the main component of the atmosphere. And it's cold enough on Mars that at least during polar winters, it will freeze out onto the atmosphere. Uh, in 1966, we started having our first measurements of the density of Mars' atmosphere. There was predictions made that over the course of one Mars year, the atmospheric pressure at the surface would change as the polar ice caps freeze and melt or sublimate. And with the 
Viking landers, we found that was true. Um, the two Viking landers were at slightly different latitudes. They observed different kind of mean pressures. But you can see that the atmospheric pressure goes down when you're forming one of the south polar ice caps. And then as that ice cap sublimates, you're releasing that CO2 back into the atmosphere, thickening it back up. And then you start to form another polar ice cap in the opposite hemisphere's local winter. And recently, there's been some renewed interest in Mars polar caps. Uh, about a year ago, Elon Musk was on Colbert's The Late Show talking about uh, terraforming Mars and suggested that if we wanted to terraform Mars really fast, what we should do is send all our nukes at Mars' south polar cap. Uh, so by the end of this talk, I want to talk about how plausible that would be. What would happen if we threw our nukes at Mars' south polar cap? How much would that change the climate of Mars? And would it make it a pleasant place to live? But he mentioned the south polar cap, which raises an interesting question of why the south? Why not the north? And it turns out Mars' two polar caps are very different from each other. In the north, uh, you have primarily water ice. And we have this nice banded layers of alternating kind of clean and dirty water ice. The seasonal frost that we get is still carbon dioxide, but the nice structure that you're seeing on the left here is all water ice. Uh, it's also at a much lower elevation. In general on Mars, the northern hemisphere is a few kilometers lower in altitude than the southern hemisphere. And so on the south, we have much more permanent CO2 ice. And I'll talk about how we know that in a little bit. So kind of general outline for my talk today is I'm going to talk about the observations of Mars South Polar Cap, uh, what we see, how we know what we know about it, uh, and then give an idea of how that stratigraphy that we see might have gotten there. And I will finish on this, what would happen if we released all the volatiles stored there into the Martian atmosphere. Most of the data I'm going to be showing you today comes from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. Uh, I'll be showing some images from the high-resolution camera high-rise, and also be talking about this large boom across the top here, which is the radar instrument. And I'll talk about how that works in a minute. Uh, to start with, we have a geologic map of Mars' south polar cap, so that you can see the pole on the right here. And the only thing really to take away from this is we have several different layers stacked on top of each other that we can map out even just using imagery. We have this white layer, which covers uh, most of the cap. We have this kind of pinkish layer directly under it, and this magenta layer under that. Uh, I'm going to start off by showing an image kind of from up here in this white region. And what we see is what we call Swiss cheese terrain, because there's all these kind of pock marks on the surface. What we think is happening here is if you have a smooth surface of CO2 ice, there's still going to be some amount of roughness in that. Nothing's going to be perfectly smooth in nature. And if you have a little divot in the surface, that's going to be able to collect a little bit more sunlight than its neighboring spot that's flat. And if you collect a little bit more sunlight, you're going to warm up a little bit, which allows you to sublimate away. So this is CO2 ice where once you get that little spot, you start to sublimate, and that makes you a little bit deeper, and you can sublimate more. And we actually see these pits growing between Mars years. Now, in other places in this same unit, we see terrain looks like this, which we call fingerprint terrain. And we think that this is places where these pits might have kind of started to run into each other and merge. So, we know that this top unit is CO2 ice because we can see it actively sublimating and changing between Mars years. And now I'm going to focus on this little pit down at the bottom here that's kind of on the boundary between these three layers to understand what that material underneath it is. So this is a picture of that pit. You can see the nice CO2 ice up at the top here. Uh, one interesting thing about this is we don't really know how this pit formed. The fact that it's so round means that it could very well be an impact crater. It's about four kilometers across. Um, but it could also be a sublimation collapse pit, essentially. 
And it's hard to tell those two possibilities apart. So I'm going to kind of ignore how this got here and just look at the surroundings. If we look at the top of this image and zoom in, we see the same sublimation pits forming. But here they're fairly shallow. And they're kind of bottoming out onto that underlying layer. If we look towards the bottom of this pit, uh, oh, so this turned out a little bit dark, but this is kind of the rim here. I might actually go back so we can see things a little bit better. All right, so let's kind of look at this area here. And you can kind of see there's these lines, these kind of cracks that are forming. Now, these are very similar to what we see on the Earth, actually. This is an image from Antarctica. And we can see cracks forming in the ice there with this kind of regular polygon structure of about the same scale of the ones that we're seeing on Mars. Um, so here's another image of this from the ground. They're easiest to see because the snow in the ground kind of highlights the edges. It lasts there longer than the surroundings. And because we can study these here on the Earth, we have a pretty good idea of how these might be forming in these really dry environments where the water isn't really ever melting. But over the course of a year, the water is heating up and cooling off. So we have these thermal expansion and contraction driving some stresses in the ice. This can generate uh, oops, uh, cracks in the ice. And then you'll have debris and dust get into those. Once you do that, you're kind of concentrating more heating and cooling at that crack, which can cause them to widen. And you can have water ice start to sublimate out through these cracks, driving them, again, even on Antarctica here on the Earth. And so we think the same thing is happening kind of at the surface level of Mars South Polar Cap. So from the imagery, what we can tell is then is we have this, oh, this permanent CO2 ice layer uh, on the top that doesn't go away from year to year, but does change. And underneath that, we have a layer of water ice. Um, now, both the kind of pink and magenta units that I showed you on the geologic map earlier both look like water ice. They look at, like water ice from their morphology and when we look at them spectrally. So we can't really see much difference in them. So in order to understand what's beneath that surface veneer then, we're going to use radar. Um, so that long boom on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, SHROD, the shallow radar instrument, essentially it sends out pulses of radar from the spacecraft down to the surface. And then some of that energy is reflected off the surface back to the spacecraft, and we can time how long that takes. But some of the energy keeps going into the subsurface. And whenever there's a change in material properties, some more energy will be reflected back to the spacecraft. And we can time how long that takes as well. And from this, we build up a picture that looks like this. These are two radar grams going across Mars South Polar Cap. Uh, off to the left here is kind of towards that small crater I showed you. And off to the right is more. Uh, towards the first image I showed you, kind of uh, up from the image. And I'll show you where these are on that map view in a moment. But what we see is we have this nice surface reflection at the top. And then we have these large, clear regions. Now, water ice and CO2 ice have fairly different dielectric constants, fairly different electrical properties to the radar as it passes through which is nice because it means we can tell the difference by looking at essentially how much energy is lost as the radar signal passes through these layers. And these large, clean layers are all CO2 ice. Uh, from the scale bar, you can see that these are hundreds of meters to essentially a kilometer thick in places. And so we can take hundreds of these radar slices across the South Polar Cap. Um, and put them together to kind of build up a map of how thick Mars South Polar Cap is. And I'll add a scale bar to this in a minute. Uh, what we can see is we have some really thick regions. This is where it's kind of kilometer thick. 
and other regions where it's petering out. We don't have any data within three degrees of the polar cap because of the spacecraft orbit. So the spacecraft never passes over that region. What we do find, too, is that the outline of where we're able to map the CO2 ice in the radar corresponds really well with the uh, kind of magenta unit here that was mapped using imagery. And so we think that these two units are the same thing. That in places we're seeing just a layer of water ice, and then maybe other places we're seeing just a thin veneer of water ice on top of this massive CO2 deposit. And this is helpful for us if, when we want to extrapolate and say, well, we know how thick this unit is here, but how thick is it in here? How much is in the places where we can't see it? And so kind of update that model we have of what the stratigraphy looks like. We now have this uh, thin CO2 deposit at the top, a layer of water ice, and then something like a kilometer of CO2 ice underneath that. Uh, so this is essentially me. So here's the scale bar here, and I'll come back to this in a second. There's uh, more structure here, though, than just it being pure CO2 ice. If we look closely at the radar, you can also see that there's these uh, reflectors in the middle of the CO2 ice, we call these bisecting layers. Uh, from the amount of energy that's lost as the radar passes through these, we can tell that these are primarily water ice and fairly clean water ice at that. And that also makes sense just from a material standpoint. These layers are tens of meters thick. And it's hard to think of any material that you could have on Mars that's not CO2 ice that would be abundant in such quantities to be able to have these thick beds within the CO2 ice. So this pretty much has to be water ice. So we can update that picture again. So now we have this kind of repeating pattern. At the very bottom, we have thick kilometers thick of water ice. And then we have this alternating series of a few hundred meters of CO2 with tens of meters of water ice. A few hundred meters of CO2 with tens of meters of water ice. And so it looks like whatever put this here was on some sort of repeating cycle. We don't see um, two reflectors in all places. We see two reflectors kind of down in this region and some places here uh, where the cap is the thickest. Sometimes we only see one reflector. Um, and we have this area fairly well mapped, so we can be fairly confident that we're seeing the reflectors that are there. So now I'm going to kind of transition. Now we have this, this structure of alternating layers of CO2 ice and water ice and talk about how did these layers get there? What is this telling us about the history of Mars climate? And the kind of critical thing to understand, the largest effect here is going to be the obliquity. On the Earth today, we have an obliquity of about 23 and a half degrees. That's what gives us our seasons. Mars has a very similar obliquity. Currently, it's about 25 degrees. But here on the Earth, that obliquity doesn't change very much. The moon helps kind of stabilize it from the Earth's obliquity changing by more than a few degrees. Mars doesn't have any large moons. So as Mars goes around in its orbit, it gets tugged on by the other planets, primarily Jupiter. And so that obliquity can change fairly wildly. And so we end up with these kind of three different regimes that we can end up in. At very low obliquities, we can end up in a place where um, at the poles, the sun never gets very high on the horizon. It's always staying very low. And so the poles don't warm up very much in their local summer. And so you get a lot of CO2 frost developing. And because you have a lot of CO2, you're essentially collapsing the atmosphere out onto the poles. We have environments like we have today in the middle, where we have some CO2 being exchanged between the poles during their summer and winter, and small residual caps on both. And then we can end up in a more extreme situation at really high obliquities, 
where the sun gets so high during polar winter that things get warm enough that you can actually get rid of all the ice or nearly all the ice from the poles. And the place where ice becomes most stable is actually in more equatorial regions, probably places like within craters or canyons where you have some local topography that would be shading you. So because the atmosphere and the ice caps are intimately linked together, as we have lower obliquity, we have a thinner atmosphere. And as we go to higher obliquities, we have a much thicker atmosphere. And as you get a thicker atmosphere on Mars, you also get more dusty because you you're better able to suspend dust particles up into the air. Uh, in Mars current day configurations, we see global dust storms that occur every few Mars years or so. Um, and if you have a very thin atmosphere, you're not really going to be able to suspend very much dust at all. And this is important for trying to understand why the water ice we see at the south is so clean. We can model the obliquity of Mars past fairly accurately because we understand the physics of how it's getting tugged around by the other planets, at least into the recent past. Um, and that's what I've done here. The dashed line through the middle is Mars' current obliquity as kind of a reference. And so the main thing just to take away from this is that the any time we're in the top half of this graph, we're going to have ice caps retreating. They're going to be fairly unstable. And when we're in the lower part of this graph, that's when you might be able to deposit large amounts of CO2 ice on your polar caps. Now, this is nice because it gives us that nice kind of cyclic pattern that we want in order to be able to lay down these different layers of CO2 ice and water ice. But it also poses a problem in that after every period where we might reasonably be able to deposit large amounts of CO2 ice, we end up in a period where all that CO2 ice should go away and just go right back into the atmosphere. So why do we have anything that we can still observe today? And this is where those water ice layers are probably really important. I grew up in Colorado. And if you left any pipes out near the surface during the winter, any water in those was going to freeze. But if you buried those pipes a few meters below the surface, well, there the temperature doesn't really change between summer and winter. It's always going to be fairly moderate. Maybe the water ice here is playing a similar role for the CO2 ice that that soil was playing for the pipes in Colorado. Um, if, as long as the water ice is thick enough, it will prevent the variations between summer and winter temperatures from making it down to the CO2 ice, essentially protecting it. And because we know the thermal properties of water ice fairly well, we can calculate how thick that water ice should be, or would need to be, to protect the CO2 underneath it. And it turns out it needs to be a few tens of meters thick, which is how thick we observe those water ice layers are with the radar. So this at least works in theory. So now I'm going to kind of walk through how this, how this south polar cap might have been put together. I'm going to start about 350,000 years ago during an ice obliquity minimum, essentially counting back three obliquity minimums from the present day. Because we're at an obliquity minimum, we can form this nice layer of CO2 ice on top of the water ice basement that was there. But now we need to form a layer of water ice on top of this. So how does that happen? Well, last October, during Halloween, I went and bought some dry ice in the grocery store and poured some warm water over it to get this nice smoky effect. And after an hour or so, what I was left with was bits of CO2 ice encased in frozen water ice. And that's because as the CO2 is sublimating, it's cooling off its surroundings. It's stealing energy from its surroundings, freezing that water. So maybe a very similar thing could happen on Mars. Maybe. As this CO2 ice is sublimating, it should be cooling the local atmosphere quite a bit. That atmosphere is going to be fairly thin because we're in an obliquity minimum. And so this gives you a nice natural explanation for how you might lay down a layer of water ice 
on top of that layer of CO2 ice to protect it. Now we can do this during the next obliquity minimum, about 200,000 years ago. And then again at the most recent one, about 50,000 years ago. And we end up with a stratigraphy that looks a lot like what we observe today at Mars South Polar Cap. We can essentially do one better than this and throw this into a model and see, well, if we use these three obliquity minimums that I've suggested, would we actually deposit enough ice at Mars South Polar Cap? The deposits that we see there today have as much CO2 in them as is in the entire atmosphere of Mars. So this is a significant amount of CO2 ice that we need to lay down. So what I'm showing here is essentially a model that's doing that. At the very top, we have that same plot of obliquity versus time. And we have vertical lines here just to kind of guide your eye to the obliquity minimums. We're starting with a Mars that has twice as much CO2 in its atmosphere as the current Mars, essentially taking all that CO2 that's currently at the South Polar Cap, sticking it up into the atmosphere to start with. And every time you see this surface pressure graph drop down, that's because a significant amount of ice has formed at either the north or south polar cap of Mars. So if you can see that if we go back really far, we expect there to be large CO2 deposits in the north, but not necessarily the south. And if we just kind of take those last three obliquity minimums, oh, I should mention, sorry, this bottom graph is the amount of ice at the south polar cap. Uh, the green is the closest to the cap, and the purple is the zone where we can measure it with radar, just a little bit away from the pole. What we find is that we're going to take this model, let it deposit some ice at the south polar cap, and then we're just going to turn off sublimation by essentially artificially putting on that water ice layer there, not letting it go back in the atmosphere. If we do that for the last three obliquity minimums, we end up putting about the right amount of CO2 at Mars South Polar Cap. Now, this doesn't necessarily tell us that this is how it happened. It tells us that this works. But there are ways that maybe you could form it during one of these earlier times, set down a nice layer of water ice, and preserve it from then into the present day. That's probably a little bit harder to do, because in between these more extreme obliquity minimums in the past, you also have more extreme maximums, which might remove that water ice. But we just don't know at this point. All right, so I'm going to kind of move into the last part of my talk, kind of pulling this together and talking about what the effects on Mars climate would be if we took all the CO2 ice that we have stored at the south and uh, put it in the atmosphere. So we can map out the volume of uh, the CO2 ice there with radar. We know the mass of that CO2 ice. And we know how much energy it takes to take a kilogram of CO2 ice and turn it into CO2 gas. So we can calculate the amount of energy that you need in order to take all the CO2 that we see at Mars South Polar Cap and put it in the atmosphere. And it works out to be on the order of 10 to the 22 joules. And if that doesn't mean anything to you, that's fine, because it doesn't really mean anything to me either. But we can compare that with how much energy we have stored on our nuclear arsenal. Uh, the bomb dropped on Hiroshima is something like 5 times 10 to the 16 joules, so significantly less than the amount of energy we would need. But we've also developed much more energetic weapons. Um, according to Wikipedia, so take these numbers with a grain of salt here, <clears throat> the all-nuclear tests up to 96 released something on the order of 10 to the 21 joules. And our current world inventory of nuclear weapons, mostly stored by the US and Russia, is something on the order of 10 to the 22 joules. So this is saying that if you were able to take all of the nuclear weapons that we have here on the Earth and with 100% efficiency, use them to use that energy to sublimate Mars south polar caps, you could, you'd be close to getting it all in the atmosphere. Um, 
Now, you probably couldn't do this with 100% efficiency because you're going to have things like shock waves and all the radiation going out into space that you would see when these things were detonating and things like that. But you could probably sublimate at least a significant fraction of Mars South Polar Cap. So what would that do to Mars? Currently, Mars' atmosphere is about half a percent of the pressure of the Earth's atmosphere. So if you double that, you get Mars' atmosphere to be about 1% of the Earth's atmosphere. That's equivalent to being at about 30 kilometers altitude, so something like three times higher than planes fly. So that's not going to make Mars a pleasant place to be walking around without a spacesuit by any means. Uh, would it be enough to warm Mars? Uh, that's a harder question to answer, just by simply simple calculations. The difference in kind of mean temperature between the Earth and the Mars is about 70 degrees Celsius. And that's a big range to try and jump. So it seems unlikely that just by um, doubling Mars' current atmosphere, that would give you enough to push you there. It might make local areas warmer or even have more consistent temperatures throughout the year, though. So this might help you a little bit, but it's certainly not going to make Mars a very Earth-like place. So what are, what are kind of the next steps? What do we want to go with this in the future? One of the big outstanding questions here is why is all this ice at the south? If you do a simple model of Mars climate, the north polar cap is a few kilometers lower in altitude, so the pressures there should be higher, which actually makes it much easier to deposit CO2 ice in the north than in the south. And this is a problem that's been known for a very long time, and it's not been an easy one to answer. Maybe there's something with the topography. If you look closely at the radar, you see that the CO2 is mostly trapped in these kind of local valleys on the south polar cap. Maybe that's either driving the CO2 ice to be deposited there, or maybe that's a place where it's easier to trap it between obliquity maximums. Or maybe the CO2 ice kind of flows into those, or all of the above. What controls this water ice deposition? Um, I gave a kind of nice hand wavy hypothesis here that as you're sublimating CO2 ice, that would cool the local atmosphere and drive water ice deposition. But there's a lot of details to how that would actually work that we haven't figured out. You know, how does depositing that water ice change the amount of CO2 ice? Can you deposit the water ice fast enough? Things like that. Um, so that's an important question to hopefully be answered with future modeling and other efforts. And then this last one is, can we tie these specific layers that we see to particular obliquity minimums in the past? Essentially asking, can we age date Mars South Polar Cap just by looking at the stratigraphy and understanding the physics that goes into this. I think this is going to be uh, a very hard question and maybe one that doesn't get answered until you actually are drilling ice cores on Mars South Polar Cap. Um, but it's certainly an interesting one to look at. Uh, so it looks like I'll have plenty of time for questions here. But I want to leave you with some takeaway points here. Mars South Polar Cap has as much carbon dioxide, as much dry ice as the entire atmosphere of Mars. So it's clearly played a very important role in how Mars has changed on these long geologic timescales. From the radar stratigraphy, we can see that it was deposited over these several kind of distinct cycles of alternating depositing CO2 ice and water ice. And we think that water ice is critical for preserving the CO2 ice in between these obliquity minimums when stable, basically keeping it around. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carver. A very cool topic. <laughs> There's plenty of time for questions, and I will <laughs> run the microphone around. Uh, Leonard, why not, since you have a dog in this fight, I will. <laughs> The uh, images you showed of the South Polar Cap, is that um, winter or summer? 
Those were all in local summer. Those were all in local summer. So that summer. was after the seasonal CO2 frost had already sublimated away, or at least the majority of that frost. And how much more of that is there? I mean, how much, how much of them of the mass of the uh, cap? How, how much does the mass of the cap differ in summer and winter? Um, so, and I know it in terms of thickness better. Okay. Um, essentially, that seasonal cap that you're developing is going to be on the order of meter or a few meters thick. Oh, so it's a lot less. Yeah, it's a significant amount less. It is enough to noticeably change the pressure by a millibar or half a millibar or so, depending on which pole you're talking about, because the seasons are much stronger in the north. We deposit a lot more CO2 ice in the northern winter than in the southern winter. Part of that's because of the lower elevation, and part of that's also because Mars orbit is more, has a higher eccentricity than the Earth. So during southern winter, you're closer to the sun than during northern winter. Thanks. Good talk. Uh, so what percentage of the permanent south polar cap is water versus CO2? And you can get that in volume or mass. I don't care. Well, it depends on what you want to count. Um, so if we go to this geologic map, the part of the cap that I was just totally ignoring for this talk is these kind of blue and green layers underneath. And those extend out much farther to much higher uh, latitudes. And those are also much thicker. These are probably a few kilometers, although we can't see the bottom with radars. We don't really know. Um, so there's probably much more water ice than CO2 ice there. Um, but it looks like that water ice is probably frozen on millions of years time scales, uh, or maybe longer. OK, so the question was, counting all of those deposits, is there more water in the Arctic or Antarctic of Mars? And I don't know the answer to that. Maybe I could interject a question, Carver, myself. Yeah. Uh, you said that taking all the nuclear weaponry that we have here on Earth, throwing it at the South Pole of Mars, uh, may or may not, in fact, improve the climate of Mars to the point yes. where we'd like to include, although it might have some interesting geopolitical consequences, <laughs> particularly if some of the rockets failed on takeoff. But. <laughs> But what if you forgot CO2 as a greenhouse gas, and you just threw old refrigerators at Mars with the chlorofluorocarbons? <laughs> what, what, I mean, could you do it that way? I, off the top of my head, I don't know. Again, you need, a fair, you need a significant amount of warming to really make a difference. And you might get enough to uh, get rid of the kind of 10 meters of CO2 frost that we have today on the residual cap there. But I'm not sure that that would be enough to really penetrate down through the water ice layers that we see and get at these large reservoirs. Yes. OK. Let's try this. Side. Why is the Martian atmosphere almost exclusively carbon dioxide in the first place? Well, um, that's a good question. A lot of the atmosphere of Mars has been lost over time. Mars is a much smaller planet, has lower gravity, so you've had a lot of species that have been stripped away by the solar wind, uh, maybe by impacts. CO2 probably has been kept around a little bit because at times it can freeze to the surface. Why there isn't any other major species that we see kept around as well, um, I'm not sure, but that would be my guess, is that essentially everything else has been lost to space. Uh, your obliquity graph, uh, going back one million years, seems to converge on 25 degrees. Is that a long, long-term cycle, or is it stabilizing? Uh, let's see if I included that at the end here. Oh, OK. Um, the obliquity with time, if I took it out even longer, you would see that uh, there are times when it oscillates a lot, and then there's times where it kind of those oscillations damp down, and you just have small oscillations for a while, and then it kicks back up. Um, so what this is essentially is the combined torques from everything in the solar system, but primarily Jupiter pulling on Mars, and you just get these 
changes in the amplitude of the swing. On the Earth, we have Milankovitch cycles, which are essentially the same thing and have a similar pattern, where you have some large swings for a while, and then it dampens out. Right now, we're going into a period where it's dampening out. Going back to those uh, cycles of, of obliquity, clearly they go back much longer. Your model only went back three cycles. Uh, yep. what, what happens if you keep going back? So one of the reasons we decided to not keep going back is if your obliquity gets too high, and I don't know what too high is, but if it gets too high, you're going to get rid of all the water ice that's protecting the CO2. Um, if you go back farther in time, there are larger obliquity maximums that you see. As you start to go farther and farther and back in Mars time too, the, our uncertainty in what the obliquity was starts to go way up. Um, because you start to become really sensitive to small details of how things are tugging on each other in the solar system. Um, my understanding from the professional terraformers is that uh, terraforming Mars would involve throwing a lot more stuff at it, like ice asteroids. Um, do you know anything about those effects? Well, if you have an impact, you have a lot of energy. So, um, yeah, essentially what you're going to need is you need a lot of mass to put into the atmosphere, one way or another. And so uh, bringing in volatiles uh, from impactors would be one way to do that. I haven't actually seen any numbers on like how much people are planning on throwing at Mars, though. I've heard that idea bantered around, but I haven't seen any numbers on it, so it's hard to say. To, to follow up on the impact idea of warming Mars, would it be more efficient to take nuclear bombs to divert asteroids so that they <laughs> <laughs> collide with Mars than to explode them directly on Mars? Would this leverage up your energy effect? <laughs> I think Terry wants the contract. <laughs> I don't know about using the nuclear weapons to divert the asteroids, but you probably could do it for less energy by diverting something to impact the South Polar Cap, just because it's not going to take as much energy to um, change something's orbit if you have, say, you have something with left mass and you're patient enough to get it to impact. Then you get all of the energy from the momentum, essentially, of whatever you're throwing at the South Polar Cap, and that could be significant. Um, so, in terms of a pure energy balance, that's probably more efficient. Um, yeah. It, it, this sounds like you're, you're fairly confident that eventually we'll do something. <laughs> well, I kind of hope we don't so that we have all of this information, this record, and we can go drill ice cores in Mars South Polar Cap instead. <laughs> that's like trying to protect the burrowing owls in North Beach. <laughs> Uh, this obliquity graph that you have, it goes back to hundreds of thousands of years. Yes. Now, how do you know that? Um, by modeling the spin of Mars and how the torques on that spin go back, um, have been changed in time by interactions with the other planets. So it, it's essentially a, I don't want to call it a simple model, but the physics in it is fairly simple in the torques that are being applied to it. Are you certain that that's a correct graph? That's going an awfully long way on a, I mean, is there an observational uh, record that you can refer to that's, that confirms it? Yeah, so not necessarily on Mars, but on Earth, we run the same models. And we have a lot of information about what the past climates on the Earth were. And there seems to be good agreement between our modeling of how the Earth's obliquity and orbit have changed through time and what we observe for Mar or the Earth's blast climates. Um, in terms of the nukes, um, would you have to do it every year? 
<laughs> well, that depends on how much you're able to warm things up, in part. Um, Mars per current south polar cap, one uh, really interesting question that I don't think there's a definitive answer on, is that, that thin upper layer of CO2, that 10 meters or so, is that currently stable, or is that receding or growing? What we can tell is that those pits are growing, so clearly there's sublimation going on. It also looks like in really flat, smooth areas, things are growing a little bit. And we can't see any obvious changes in the pressure over the uh, few decades that we've been observing Mars that tells us whether there's a clear trend and whether the, there's more CO2 being added to the atmosphere removed. So it looks like this kind of 10 meters of CO2 ice might be stable for long periods in Mars' current climate, or at least be right on that line. So if you were able to put more CO2 ice in the atmosphere and kind of kept the current obliquity, you might warm things up a little bit, and so it might actually be stable in the atmosphere as well. Do your studies have any implications for the understanding of causes or possible management of Earth's global warming? Um, well, because the Earth is much too warm for CO2 to ever freeze out, I'm not sure um, how much implications this would have for that in particular. Um, I think it has more implications for how uh, maybe Pluto's climate changes over yearly time scales or longer time scales because there again we have another world where in this case nitrogen but the dominant species in the atmosphere is right at that point where it'll freeze out or be in the atmosphere and so you can alternate between these cycles. What, what about for tidally locked uh, planets around red dwarf stars? The, the, the hmm. concern there was always that the atmosphere would freeze out on the back side. Yeah. I don't know enough about those to want to speculate too far. <laughs> Other questions? No? OK. Well, Carver, thank you very much for an extraordinarily interesting talk. Uh, Adrian realized you would be offended by the usual $5,000 honorarium, so <laughs> he sent this mug instead. All right. Let's thank our speaker.